Welcome to day two of our uh, digital symposium, Rosa Luxemburg at 150, Revisiting Her Life and Legacy, hosted by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and the International Rosa Luxemburg Society. Uh, my name is Lauren Fellhorn. I'm an editor here at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and one of the moderators uh, and coordinators of the conference um, this week. Uh, we already had a great first day yesterday with um, uh, five uh, pretty fantastic speeches and panels, um, all of which I don't have the time to go through uh, right now, but um, I thought we had a particularly interesting panel about how we can use Rosa Luxemburg's um, um, ideas and sort of a Luxembourgian lens to understand um, uh, contemporary politics and labor struggles in Latin America, demonstrating sort of the uh, uh, multiple uh, temporal and geographic spaces that Luxembourgian ideas can be applied to. We also had uh, Michael Levy, a very accomplished scholar, talking about what Rosa Luxemburg can teach socialists today about internationalism and uh, also about the climate crisis, uh, even if Luxembourg herself um, did not anticipate the climate crisis. And what I thought was particularly fascinating um, uh, was uh, Dr. Sibok Chang's discussion of Rosa Luxemburg's reception that I think probably hearing about for the first time and that I was particularly honored uh, having been born and spent some of my life in South Korea uh, um, to host um, uh, such a unique presentation um, uh, on, uh, at our conference. Um, we have another full day uh, uh, of discussions today that I'm really looking forward to. Um, we uh, would like to um, thank uh, our speakers who are participating today, as well as everybody who's, who's watching us on the chat. A reminder, um, throughout the conference, uh, we will be monitoring the chat on our Facebook page. And if you have questions for speakers um, that you'd like to ask, or maybe a comment, feel free to type it in the chat, and we'll make sure that um, the, speakers, the speakers hear from you. Another thing that I think the... Um, uh, uh, the conference yesterday really demonstrated is uh, the sheer diversity of Rosa Luxemburg's thought and uh, to what extent her ideas um, on a number of different topics have been applied in different eras. Um, so, uh, for example, our panel yesterday on Latin America, um, as well as some of the discussions uh, earlier in the day, I think uh, really uh, demonstrated to what extent uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, in a context of uh, an authoritarian socialism, uh, to what extent her writings on freedom, uh, freedom of dissent, freedom of opinion, uh, became a, a, a point of fixation for, for thinkers in this specific context. Whereas um, the panel last night on creolizing Rosa Luxemburg, uh, I think was a great example of another strand of interpretation of Rosa Luxemburg's thought that really focuses on, uh, on, her, on her life as a woman in a, a very masculine and male dominated atmosphere, but also her hybrid identity as a, a Jew and as a Pole living um, in Germany, or in Imperial Germany, um, uh, during a time of uh, pretty intense uh, popular anti Semitism. Um, and I think sort of this, this, these, this diversity of, um, of, uh, of, of interpretation suggests is that um, Rosa Luxemburg cannot really be uh, nailed down as one person or one thinker, um, or more, more, perhaps more specifically, you can't distill the pure and correct Rosa Luxemburg to be applied 100 years later. She was someone who lived at a different time in a different context and who wrote about a lot of different subjects. We're actually gonna have two panels today one on political strategy and another on theories of economic crisis, uh, where I think we'll get a lot more to chew on in terms of to what extent can her political and economic ideas be directly applied today or to what extent uh, they need updating. But I think what we can take from all that is less what did Rosa Luxemburg say about question X or what was her answer uh, to problem Y, but see her as kind of a model and an inspiration for what um, a socialist activist or person should be someone who is um, uh, incredibly serious, incredibly dedicated to the truth, and also uh, devoted to the idea that uh, what she does, what she thinks, is not only about um, building up her own personal brand, but about strengthening a movement for changing and transforming the world. Because uh, as we should, I'm sure we all remember, Rosa Luxemburg was not just uh, uh, an author or, or an academic at a university somewhere, but rather someone who wrote and taught at the SPD party school and whose entire life 
all of her theoretical output was devoted um, uh, to informing and enriching the socialist workers movement that uh, that was really um, the the essence of her of her life. And that's obviously a world, a context in which she lived that we don't have anymore today. So, um, uh, but what I think we st can still take with that or take from that and remember today on what would have been her 150th birthday, embody that spirit and reinterpret it, recreate it uh, today in a drastically different context where nevertheless a, a socialist movement is as badly as sorely needed as ever. Um, so with that, uh, I'd just like to point out a couple uh, or one change to the program that we have coming up. Uh, the next event uh, right after me will be Rosa Luxemburg and the Challenge of Political Strategy, chaired by my colleague Johanna. Um, but between that, we're going to have the premiere of a exhibition that our Hanoi office in Hanoi, Vietnam uh, is hosting right now about Rosa Luxemburg uh, entitled, Those Who Do Not Move Cannot Feel Their Chains. Uh, that will be premiering at 1.15 Central European time here uh, on our Facebook page, so right after this panel. And uh, then we will have at two o'clock, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and the Written Word, chaired by my colleague, Julia Killett, with Kate Evans, Helen Scott, in the hills, um, followed by the accumulation of capital and the mass strike in the crisis of neoliberal capitalism at four. And then our closing keynote from Peter Hudis of the International Rosa Luxemburg Society on using Rosa Luxemburg to understand uh, racialized capitalism. Thanks again to everyone who's participated so far and everybody who's tuning in today. And with that, I will hand it off to my colleague, Johanna. Okay. Hello and very warm welcome also from my side. Thank you, Lauren, for giving an overview. I want to use um, the time we have in between because we should not start um, that much before um, in five minutes. Um, uh, to thank some of the people who made this very special event happening because we had yesterday we had some small problems to um, to start technically it's the first time that we are doing such a large event with participants from all over the world ourselves when the pandemic um, uh, showed us last year that we probably could not come together um, on an international conference, we try to take it as a chance. And I guess um, it worked out because we made it happen that we had all those wonderful panels um, and we had yesterday and we are going to have uh, today to talk about Rosa Luxemburg. I want to um, thank Lauren and Wiebke, Lauren Ballhorn and Wiebke Boyshausen from our team here in RLS who made this whole thing happen. And Otto Kaluban, who um, did the great task to bring all those researchers from everywhere in the world um, together. So um, thanks to the three of you um, that we could do that. Um, of course, today um, the weather in Berlin is, uh, is sunny and very bright. And if you could see our building, our new Rosa Luxemburg building right here, you, you see a large banner, 150 years of Rosa Luxemburg. And a lot of other things are happening in the, in the city by the same time. We have a lot of events everywhere in the world. So Lon already mentioned films in the Hanoi office. We, we have events in Latin America. We have events in New York and everywhere remembering Rosa Luxemburg. So um, what, what the question which was in my mind is um, what would Rosa Luxemburg have thought herself when she would see us here um, celebrating her life and her legacy 150 years after? She probably would have been happy, but on the other hand, she she would have called us very much to, to think about the most important um, aspects of her work. Lon already mentioned some of them. And I guess we should use the chance um, that we are all here together to, to remember that she would ask us for a strong internationalism, which is leaking, I guess, right now a little bit or missing um, to... Um, and to, oh, yeah, uh, to, uh, to, to counter the far right, um, which is still uh, rising um, as in the times as she lived. So now um, I want to welcome you to the next panel. Um, 
And I see that uh, that also our third speaker, Joshua Varbrand, arrived. So that's very good that you are here. Um, our panel um, about uh, Rosa Luxemburg and the challenge of political strategy. I'm very happy um, to, to welcome um, our three speakers, Michael Brie, Joshua Varbrand, and Lea Ippi. Michael Brie is a a professor of political theory and a long-term colleague of ours in the Rosa Luxemburg um, Foundation. He is working on democratic socialism, on the history and theory of it. And together with Jörn Schüttrumpf, he just uh, published a new book on, um, uh, on Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, we will explore a little bit as well later. Lea Ippi is a pro professor of political theory since 2016 at the London School of Economics, long-term partner of also of our new London office um, there. And Lea um, has worked on many aspects of Rosa Luxemburg, especially on the accumulation of capital. Joshua Warwand is a researcher at the University Champagne Aden in Reims and is working very much on the education of, um, of Rosa Luxemburg. And I'm very happy to discuss the question of political theory, um, which is very important for the left today again in Rosa Luxemburg's work with the three of you. Um, so I'm very happy if Julia could start and then Joshua and then Misha with your inputs. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you and to celebrate Rosa Luxemburg's um, birthday. Uh, I guess I'm going to focus in discussing the question of political strategy on two issues, uh, picking up on two issues of Rosa Luxemburg's thought that I think are inspiring and instructive for us when thinking about challenges that the left faces today internationally. And the two questions that I wanted to uh, focus on are, uh, first of all, the controversial question of her critique of uh, national self-determination. And the second one, the question of the uh, relationship between reform and revolution when thinking about uh, challenges, strategic challenges for the left. And I'm going to talk about these two because I think when we think about political strategy and how we should develop political strategy, any reflection about political strategy needs to start with uh, some account of the political challenges that we face. And I think starting with Luxembourg's analysis of uh, her critique of national self-determination actually helps us, uh, I think, focus on one aspect of political strategy that has been somewhat marginalized by at least the mainstream left in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, which is uh, the concept of class as a kind of organizing concept of political conflict. And so I want to make a case for uh, the importance of reviving the idea of class uh, for political conflict and for understanding, analyzing and moving forward uh, politics really for the left. But to do that, I think it's instructive to start with, the, uh, with Rosa Luxemburg's critique of national self-determination, because I think in that critique of national self-determination, we see her best account of what is problematic with taking the nation state as the uh, most important organizing unit of political struggle. So I think it's useful to start with her critique of national self-determination, even though in Europe, at least, the question of national self-determination is not as central as it was in Luxembourg's time. But I think there is a, a, a question that is related to that one, which is how to deal with um, cultural diversity, what is often presented as cultural conflict, uh, the preservation of national identity, which were all questions around which she framed her critique of national self-determination. And uh, Luxembourg's critique of national self-determination was actually controversial at the time in which she uh, articulated it. It was not the mainstream amongst Marxists. She was a Pole and a Jew, as was said yesterday, who was, um, uh, born in a Jewish family in Russian-occupied Poland, and she stood out from the uh, Polish socialists of her time, Pol Polish uh, mainstream Polish social democrats of her time, in rejecting uh, Poland's national right to self-determination, and in making a very different, uh, some might say extremist argument for why it was not actually in the interests of the working classes to defend national self-determination. 
So I think, uh, and, and the, the reason she made this argument was that she believed that if you only uh, aspire to a share in decision making within the representative institutions of parliamentary democracy, even at their best, this actually, uh, this was her core argument, this means very little when uh, politi the political life of these states is framed and shaped by, on the one hand, global politics, and so the, the politics of superpowers, the interests of superpowers, uh, the concerns of globalization and the constraints that globalization places on us, and the labor movement, which she also thought needs to be taken uh, internationally. And so her, at the, at the background of her account of national self-determination and her critique of national self-determination, is this idea that economic and political power in the presence of globalization are interdependent and, uh, and that, of course, uh, economic power and political power within uh, dominant hegemonic uh, advanced capitalist states is parasitic on the exploitation of uh, other remote areas of the world. And this made her a skeptic of theories of political emancipation through self-determination. And it's important to note that she was a skeptic, as I say, uh, the, this was not the position of the uh, international, it was not the position of Marx and Engels themselves when they talked, for example, about Poland or when they talked about self-determination in general. It was not the mainstream position among social democrats either in Germany or in Poland. It's not, it, this was not the official position of uh, social democracy. And her critique, I think, is particularly insightful because it might help us when we think about challenges that are not exactly the challenges that she faced, but that are somewhat similar. And one example is the question of how the left should handle, for example, the problem of migration. So, and, and, and intercultural uh, diversity and what some present as cultural conflict. Uh, we know that the problem of migration is a very big challenge for the left electorally and in liberal parliamentary democracies. We know that often uh, the left is forced to make concessions politically because of its dependence on electoral processes that require mainstream left-wing movements to make certain claims about migrants. And it's very clear why, because migrants are disenfranchised, they don't have the right to vote, so uh, their voices count much less than the voices of citizens and therefore the whole process is biased uh, in favor of the nation state and in favor of um, prioritizing the concerns of the domestic left as opposed to the concerns of the kind of international left and i think uh, what luxembourg's critique of national self-determination helps us uh, free see and um, articulate is basically an account of uh, understanding that the, uh, the the central concept when thinking about political conflict and the central categories when thinking about political emancipation is not socialist emancipation that is limited to the boundaries of the nation state and that takes the nation state as its unit of concern, but that thinks about the concept of class as the central organizing um, category. And so uh, basically when Luxembourg differed from theorists of self-determination, including Lenin, as I said, including Marx, including all the other uh, social democrats of her time, who had uh, argued in favor of nation, self, national self-liberation uh, movements, what was behind her critique was how this account of national self-determination, this prioritizing of the nation state as the main unit of uh, concern ended up playing in the hands of liberal ruling elites and therefore weakening uh, both the international workers' movement and in the end domestic uh, political struggles, socialist struggles internally. So, and this is something that characterized Luxembourg's activism throughout her life. She started with this as a, as a youth, um, uh, as a member, as a youth member of the Polish revolutionary movement. When, as I said, she argued that uh, it was against the interest of the Polish working classes to become independent from Russia, uh, and that without socialist governments, she argued in Germany, in Austria, and Russia, that independence would just deepen the exploitation of um, Polish workers. It also sharpened and characterized her critique of the SPD leadership in failing to stand up to um, German imperial projects, for example, in Morocco, for fear of losing um, electoral gains. And of course, it also shaped her final break with German um, social democracy, which uh, came, as we know, during the First World War, when the uh, elected social democrat representatives in the Reichstag decided to join forces with the nationalist conservatives. And what was at the background of them then was precisely this necessity to defend the 
electoral gains of the left as a parliamentary force, understood as a parliamentary force, and in some ways the pressure to, uh, to, to be a party not just of the working class understood internationally, but to be a party of the national working class. And I think Luxembourg was uh, very critical of that stance and I think showed a kind of insight from which we can now also benefit when we think about how should the left handle, as I say, conflicts like uh, the conflicts around migration, how it's a trap to think that uh, you can, for example, argue that restricting immigration benefits domestic uh, working classes or to think that uh, the main challenges in today's globalization come from migrants or you know all the scapegoating that goes around this entire way of categorizing political conflicts today so uh, so i think it's so, so her critique of self determination as i say although it may seem remote from us because this is not a world in which you know poland needs to become independent or where there are many countries in europe where there are still conflicts around nations in europe uh, but m on the whole we take conflicts around borders as settled when we think about the nation state. But on the other hand, conflicts about borders are not settled when we think about the disenfranchisement of migrants and the exclusion of particular categories of residents from citizenship, from the benefits of citizenship and so on. And so she, and I think her analysis of self-determination and her account of the centrality of working class struggle and of class in general as a category around which we frame political conflict is very helpful for the left to navigate these questions around migration and disenfranchisement in a way that doesn't make it uh, necessarily follow what the right or what populist movements do when they argue and campaign against migrants and so on. So I think this is where her, her views are instructive. The second question of political strategy that we also uh, find ourselves uh, often uh, thinking about is this question that she also reflected on, which is the relationship between reform and, and revolution. And we know that Luxembourg made her, made her intervention, made her name in German social democracy by arguing against Bernstein, by arguing against the kind of dictum that, you know, the movement is everything and we, the goal doesn't matter. She was one of the first to see the limitations of socialism understood as a merely parliamentary force in part because of uh, what I said at the beginning about this connection between the nation state and the parliamentary struggle as necessarily bound by the uh, state and by the institutions of the state, but also in part because she was uh, always mindful of the importance of arguing for systemic change and that therefore the relationship between reform and revolution needs to always be thought through the lens of systemic change and through the uh, importance of overcoming capitalism as a system of political exploitation, of economic exploitation, and of social oppression. So uh, this is the second, I think, interesting and important insight for uh, political um, strategy today is that she argued that just as in times of war, the social democrats were wrong to think that, you know, if you don't join the military effort, you would be interpreted as a bad pa patriot. This would be a kind of failure of patriotism. In times of peace, it's also, uh, they were also wrong to think that uh, just advancing electorally and just winning elections for the sake of winning elections would by itself uh, entail the end of wage labor domination. And again, I think her, her work and her thought is really instructive here because we often find this pressure whenever left-wing parties are in the run-up to elections, it feels as if winning the election becomes an end in itself. And sometimes one uh, forgets the importance of um, thinking about the content of the message with which one needs to win the election. It, it seems as if what matters is to just get the votes and what concessions you make to get those votes becomes secondary. And I think uh, Luxembourg's critique of social democracy and reformists was also very important because it helps us articulate a conception of political parties and political partisanship in general, not just as election winning machines, but as entities and agents that are there to do something much more important, which is to uh, work with the people, to work with the masses for a kind of systemic change that might be slow, that might not go through electoral victories all the time, that needs to sort of work with, you know, what Hegelians would call the rules of history. So, um, but in making that case, 
I think on the other hand, it's also important to understand that Luxembourg didn't just oppose representation in parliament or just you know, oppose trade union struggle or didn't just oppose democratic uh, reform. In fact, uh, she was, when she founded the KPD, when they were uh, in one of the very first debates that the KPD had in Germany around whether uh, the KPD, the communist party that she helped found, should participate in election, she was outvoted, but she argued that it was very important for the KPD to be part of these elections. And these were the sort of the first elections of of the um, German Republic, so after the fall of the Kaiser. So it's important to understand that, and, and, and again, it's, that also helps us see something that comes through on her writings on women's suffrage, on how to deal with, um, with parliamentary struggles for a number of emancipatory campaigns, which is also a kind of antidote against the uh, received wisdom amongst feminists that, you know, unlike her friend and collaborator, Clara Zetkin, Luxembourg wasn't interested in the question of women's emancipation. I think her point there was that, uh, as with the critique of social democracy and, and reformists, was that the demand for social rights that is obtained through uh, parliamentary representation and the demand for women's emancipation should be integrated in a kind of more systemic uh, overall critique of capitalism, where the key is the access to political power and the kind of radical transformation of both the economic and the political structures of society. So just as she thought there could be no uh, progressive national emancipation within capitalism, she also thought there couldn't be any gender or racial emancipation within the strictures of capitalism. Um, however, it's important to, to understand that Luxembourg thought that reforms are very important because they give us crucial learning platforms through which uh, the oppressed people can develop a capacity for autonomous decision making and uh, also prepare in some ways for the exercise of political power. And, but what is important is that she thought that these reforms were in some ways experiments for freedom. They, were, they didn't give us freedom th themselves or by themselves. And this was reflected both in her uh, criticism of vanguard democratic centralist models of political organization, including her engagement with, um, with Lenin, but also in her theory of the party as rooted in the spontaneous initiatives of the masses. They were essential uh, to a kind of analysis of freedom and of democratic agency, which she thought that uh, global capitalist relations um, stopped or obstructed at a very um, deep level. So, uh, to conclude, the, she, she argued in, in response to Bernstein, and this is, I think, something that is very important to keep in mind when thinking about this question of what do we do? Is it reform or is it revolution? She thought that this was actually a false dilemma, that uh, reform isn't, as she put it, a kind of drawn out revolution, and revolution isn't a kind of condensed uh, series of reforms, because as she explained historically, the point of legal reform is to consolidate a kind of emerging uh, social class so that uh, in a way that enables the kind of existing juridical system to be dismantled in favor of a new one. And this is what she meant when she says, you know, what is the difference between reform and revolution? What it means, the difference between a reformist change and a revolutionary change has to do with the kind of change in the content of fundamental legal dispositions uh, and not so much in the way in which they're realized. When we think about revolution, we think, you know, one is nice and the other isn't, or, you know, one is slow and the other is fast. But what Luxembourg's insight was, was to say that what really, what revolution really means is a kind of fundamental change in the legal system and in the constitutional provisions that one makes in bringing certain constraints in society via uh, laws and norms. And so she uh, memorably said, you know, the difference between reform and revolution is not that these are two methods of historical progress that you can pick, as she says, you know, in the counter of history, the way you pick hot and cold sausages, and that the people who oppose reform, they don't do it because they prefer, you know, fast rather than slow or calm rather than uh, not so calm. What you do is you choose a different goal, and the goal in her case was uh, the overcoming of capitalism. So I think it's not that she rejected reformism, it's more that she reminded reformism that they should not forget what the purpose of that reform is, which is to say systemic change. And so uh, she reminded them and she cautioned them against the satisfaction with um, superficial improvements of the old order over the kind of principled commitment to overcoming that uh, system and to creating a new system. And so, and, and, and therefore she cautioned against divorcing and identify and isolating democracy from socialism. And she cautioned by saying, look, if you isolate, if you 
um, if you say that democracy is one thing and socialism is the other and you are for democracy but not necessarily for socialism what you end up is to lose both democracy and socialism and i think her words on that were really quite prophetic because if we see if we think about the long durée, if we think about 100 years of social democracy and the history of parliamentary struggles and so on where social democrats of the parliamentary kind are now is not a great place we have seen that uh, social democracy continues to lose on the electoral scene and Rosa Luxemburg would have said they continue to lose precisely because they have lost sight of the necessity for systemic uh, transformation. She was uh, one of the first to understand that overcoming capitalism is not a question of raising taxes, or it's not a question of tweaking the system of distribution of opportunities here and there, or improving the condition of workers in this or that country, because what socialism requires was a kind of commitment to a different uh, society and uh, a commitment where what happens is that you have the principle of the free development of each individual as the condition with, uh, for the free development of the others. And that system is incompatible with the pursuit of profit uh, in the way in which uh, both capitalist economic institutions do, but also the kind of technocratic hierarchies that enable the uh, development of these economic institutions. So socialism was a project of both political and economic emancipation. And it was a project that was global, not just national. And therefore, uh, she argued that the conquest of seats in parliament are not very important if they are divorced from a global effort to establish a truly free um, society. So I think um, her life and her work, in a way, are, are really important because she was one of the first, as I say, to articulate this dilemma, to explain what is really at stake in this difference between uh, social reform and revolution, and therefore in helping us think about political strategy as a kind of strategy that needs to be grounded on principles, international, but also not necessarily neglecting the need for reform, just positioning that need for reform within this uh, systemic transformational logic. So I will stop there. Thank you. So thank you, Leah. I guess we already would have a lot of things to discuss right now, but, but we're going to keep our question in mind. I saw you, Joshua, already reacting on some of the points. And um, so I hand over to you. Thanks. Okay. So hello, everyone. Uh, today, my concern will be about the relation of uh, Rosa Luxemburg to violence. And uh, I would like to make a little um, introduction to uh, present this topic. So by supporting socialism, uh, Rosa Luxemburg committed herself in a struggle toward freedom, emancipation for the greatest, num greatest number of people, uh, the ones who suffered from economic exploitation and were deprived of the basic needs to develop themselves. That's her goal. But what I want to um, take a look at it's, uh, are the means to reach this goal. Rosa Luxemburg constantly denounced capitalism as a provider of systemic violence through the development of militarism, uh, imperialism, colonialism, uh, in order to guarantee its perennialty. Leaning on violence and exploitation, how could capitalism be replaced by a new political organization where emancipation and solidarity could replace those violent structures of the, the former foundations without itself relying on the use of force. Was violence a moral question or a necessary evil for Rosa Luxemburg? So Rosa Luxemburg's relation to violence is a question which until now has never been a major focus uh, of research given that the originality of her legacy relies on values uh, that appear in total contradiction with the use of force. That is freedom of speech, democracy, uh, and the necessity of a um, voluntar vol voluntary implication of the individual in the political process of revolution. As a model for anti-authoritarian Marxism, often willingly described as an alternative to the Soviet model, associating violence with the political struggles led by Rosa Luxemburg seems, at first glance, like a historical nonsense. However, if Rosa Luxemburg supported freedom of speech and democracy, she simultaneously supported a revolutionary strategy where the direct action of the masses and the overthrow of the ruling political order were both key elements, as she already stated in 1902. I quote, 
violence is and still remains the ultima ratio of the working class too, sometimes in a latent, sometimes in an active way as the driving supreme law of the class struggle. And if we revolutionize the heads through parliamentary and every other activity, we do so in order that ultimately, if necessary, the revolution flows down from the heads to the fists. So from this quote of 1902, it seems like Rosa Luxembourg shared a more subtle opinion about violence than pure rejection for the use of force in the revolutionary process she was pleading for. In order to understand Rosa Luxembourg on this specific issue, one needs to take into account the two original traits which define the political thoughts of Rosa Luxembourg, which are revolution on one side and democracy on the other side. Both should not be dissociated as they constitute the boundaries where revolutionary violence had to be contained, but still considered for a successful revolution to happen. I quote again, democracy is indispensable to the working class because only through the exercise of its democratic rights in the struggle for democracy can the proletariat become aware of its class interests and its historic task. In a word, democracy is indispensable not because it renders superfluous the conquest of political power by the proletariat, but because it renders this conquest of power both necessary and possible. So this is how a study of Rosa Luxembourg's relation to violence can be achieved by observing the two poles of her political identity and figure out the delimitations they institute on political violence. If a revolutionary process needs the use of force in the overthrow of the former political organization, the democratic process intended after forbids any reliance on violence. So there will be two parts in uh, my considerations about Luxembourg's relation to violence. If Rosa Luxembourg is simultaneously a supporter of democracy and revolution, how did she behave towards the use of violence in the political field? Indeed, this question of violence leads to the question of authority and domination, who owns power and uh, how this power is maintained in society. So in order to deal with this issue, two times need to be distinguished in Rosa Luxembourg's thought about violence. Before the seizure of power, violence seems to be considered by uh, Rosa Luxembourg as an unavoidable tool in order to change the political system. This is the political moment where uh, Rosa Luxembourg's revolutionary stand is noticeable as she calls for the use of an uh, ultima ratio, so the, uh, a supreme law in Latin, uh, if necessary, by the working class to replace bourgeoisie uh, as the new ruling class. But after the seizure of power by the working class, violence becomes inevitably counterproductive and dangerous for the development of a new society, uh, which has for main goal emancipation. So uh, we, we should never forget the goal. This is when Rosa Luxembourg's stand on democracy appears. This is only through freedom of expression, critical thought, and the political action of the greatest number that society can regenerate and avoid um, the power relations of the past. For this reason, socialism cannot be achieved through violence and coercion. So on the first side of uh, before the seizure of uh, power, we have to look further at uh, Rosa Luxembourg's stand on uh, an, a, rev an, a revolutionary engagement or uh, the impossibility to seize power without overthrowing the, the, the present government and by violent means, if necessary. So why there is uh, a, a historical and unavoidable resort to violence in order to seize power, power in uh, Rosa Luxembourg's opinion. Can we change society in a non-violent way? That is like a democratic reform. This question drove crazy the German social democracy at the end of the 19th century, and it has led to a great split in the working class movement, which was at that time the most vivid 
and powerful in Europe. On one side, some people argued that since social democracy could legally take part in the political life uh, of Germany, uh, in 1890, anti-socialist laws decided by Bismarck in uh, 1878 were abolished. So it was only uh, now uh, uh, only a matter of time until the SPD reaches power through electoral victories and then applies uh, the policy of the working class. So revolution through the urns. This led to the birth of the reformist ale, uh, also called revisionists, represented uh, most of all by uh, Edouard Bernstein. On the other side, Rosa Luxembourg took a firm stand against reformism as this strategy was unable to fulfill its historical task of liberation for the working class. She objected quite a simple reason to this impossibility. Reform cannot replace revolution as both have radically different purposes. And she explains clearly the distinction between the goal of reform and the aim of revolution in her debate with Bernstein um, in 1898 uh, that uh, took the form of many articles that we know under the title Social Reform or Revolution. So let us speak better than I could on this matter. I quote, legislative reform and revolution are not different methods of historic development that can be picked out at the pleasure from the counter of history just as one chooses hot or cold sausages. Legislative reform and revolution are different factors in the development of class society. They condition and complement each other and are at the same time reciprocally exclusive as are the North and South Poles, the bourgeoisie and proletariat. Every legal constitution is the product of a revolution. In the history of classes, revolution is the act, the act of political creation, while legislation is the political expression of the life of a society that has already come into being. So revolution is the mother of a new society, and legislation is the daughter of this society. Let's go further. It is contrary to history to represent work for reforms as a long drawn out revolution and revolution as a condensed series of reforms. A social transformation and the legislative reform do not differ according to their duration, but according to their content. The secret of historic change through the utilization of political power resides precisely in the passage of an historic period from one given form of society to another. That is why people who pronounce themselves in favor of the method of legislative reform in place and in contra contradistinction to the conquest of political power and social revolution do not really choose a more tranquil, calmer and slower road to the same goal, but a different goal. Instead of taking a stand for the establishment of a new society, they take a stand for surface modification of the old society. All programs become not the realization of socialism, but the reform of capitalism. Not the separation of the wage labor system, but the diminution of exploitation. That is, the suppression of the abuses of capitalism instead of suppression of capitalism itself. So because reforms cannot change the nature of the political system they grow in, a system which has been established by the former ruling class and which allowed this class to rule and maintain its domination on the others, um, as the supporters of class struggle believe it, uh, it becomes nonsensical to support reformism as a peaceful way to achieve socialism for Rosa Luxembourg. It is like seizing a weapon of the opponent specifically made and with no other use than harming and submitting you. While revolution initially consists in disarming this opponent in order that he can't pull the trigger on you. Constitutions are the legal ways of monopolizing violence. And if you take power, you acquire your gun license. You set your own rules. You have your own bullets. So another question could arise after that. What about a democratic revolution? 
if we really don't like violence and that we are against the bloodshed, can we ask kindly for the bullets to be removed if we win the election? Is a democratic revolution possible? Of course, we could ask. But never has it been observed yet in history that the losers leave power without firstly trying to keep it. And if they fail at it, it's always to come back later with assistance to take back control. Denying the use of violence in the class relationships already existing is the biggest mistakes made by the reformists in uh, Luxembourg's opinion. I quote again, it is true, not for the love of violence or because of revolutionary romanticism, but because of the tough historical necessity that socialist parties must prepare themselves to violent clashes with bourgeois society sooner or later in those cases where our efforts collide against vital interests of the ruling class. Parliamentarism as exclusive means of political struggle for the working class is not less whimsical and essentially less reactionary than the general strike or the barricade as exclusive means. The violent revolution in such circumstances is without any doubt a double-edged sword difficult to handle. And we hope that the proletariat will resort to this means only once it sees it as the only possible outcome and obviously to the only condition that the political circumstances and the power balances guarantee more or less the probability of success. But the clear understanding of the necessity to use violence as well as in the different parts of the class struggle and the final conquest of state power is an indispensable step because it is indeed this clear understanding that gives impulse and efficiency to our peaceful and legal activity. Therefore, violence is not a choice here. It is an instrument initiated by the relationships existing between classes. One is ruling the other through oppression, domination, systemic violence of a legal political system created to legitimize this order and which monopolizes violence. Therefore, how could the submitted one get rid of this oppressive relationship without using force itself? So violence is not an option, but a necessity if the working class wants to seize power, to change its status of oppressed in order to become the new ruling class. But let's not forget Rosa Luxemburg's stand on democracy because for her, a revolution could only be led by the masses and for the masses. So we should never forget the goal of a revolution. And once power is seized, one revolution uh, is done and that the, the order uh, has been uh, eliminated and a new one has started, violence becomes suddenly counterproductive to exert this power. Because the final goal is still emancipation for all. The working class, the oppressed, the people, cause them like to enjoy. The people who see their forces exploited through the economic organization of society are looking for emancipation. So the duty is to get rid of the violence of this system. This oppression must find an end. But if Rosa Luxemburg sees a necessity to the resort uh, of violence in order to overthrow this uh, former ruling class, why putting instead of it a new form of oppression? Why should the working class rule through violence if it represents the vast majority of the people? If uh, violence is destructive, it can't be a tool for the new political order which has to emerge from the revolution. And here lies the biggest challenge that so socialism has to face uh, for Rosa Luxemburg. The socialist revolution consists not only in seizing power, and replacing it only by a dictatorship of the proletariat. But replacing a class uh, by uh, another in the historical cycle of oppression that defines how society is organized. Rosa Luxemburg proposed to create concomitantly with the democratic institution already in place, like parliament, new forms of democratic institutions where the freedom of expression and debate would find a practical demonstration. Uh, which are, for example, the councils. The new society intended has to be built from the ground up 
in a long process of learnings and common failures, where all the members of society participate together. In her understanding of socialism, Rosa Luxemburg cannot dissociate the democratic process from the revolutionary process, because the former provides the nourishing substance of the latter. Uh, Isabel Lurero, a Brazilian historian, explains that according to this democratic stand, the support given by Luxembourg to the Bolsheviks uh, can be understood only through the historical context they were facing at the time and cannot serve to assert Rosa Luxembourg's approval towards the unlimited use of violence uh, as it was later fulfilled under the form of political terror. And that's what she says in the Russian Revolution of 1918. So the famous uh, quote about uh, freedom uh, of those who think differently. There is a more imp important quote just after that. And she says, only experience is capable of correcting and opening new ways. Only unobstructed, un unobstructed effervescing life falls into a thousand new forms and improvisations brings to light creative new faults, itself corrects all mistaken attempts. The public life of countries with limited freedom is so poverty stricken, so miserable, so rigid, so unfruitful, precisely because through the exclusion of democracy, it cuts off the living sources of all spiritual riches and progress. Public control uh, is indispensably necessary. Otherwise, the exchange of experiences remains only with the close cir circle of the officials of the new regime. Corruption becomes inevitable. But socialism in life demands a complete spiritual transformation in the masses degraded by centuries of bourgeois rule. Social instincts in place of egotistical ones, mass initiative in place of inertia, idealism which conquers all suffering, etc., etc. No one knows this better, describes it more penetratingly, repeat, repeats it more stubbornly than Lenin, but he's completely mistaken in the means he employs. Decree, dictatorial force of the factory overseer, draconian penalties, rule by terror, all these things are but palliatives. The only way to reverse is the school of public life itself, the most unlimited, the broadest democracy and public opinion, it is ruled by terror, which demoralizes. So, it is no time to conceive a totally new order, never seen before in human history, where oppression has no more significance in the way that society is organized. Economic and political relations must not be based on the exploitation of one group of people by another group. It must, on the opposite, break the wheel of domination and set an order where the fulfillment of everybody is allowed through a different social and economic organization. How? Rosa Luxembourg was humble enough not to seek a dogma which would have a solution ready to apply. Instead of the imposed revolution from above, she pleaded for this simple but revolutionary method. Let the people do. Let them try and fail. Let them learn through that process. Let them gain experience. Let them become responsible for they become fully aware of their position and role in the society they dare to build. Let them take risks without fearing for their life, thanks to the solidarity existing between each other, like a pack of wolves during a cold winter. And once the pack is stronger and spring finally comes, here will be the time of blossom. In any case, this blossoming can only happen through the collective action of the masses through their own actions and experiences and without fearing from expressing themselves and um, an oppressive terror. I'm done. Thank you, Joshua. And so I hand over to Michael. Yeah, hello to everybody. Johanna, you asked in the beginning, uh, what would Rosa Luxemburg say for all looking on all our enterprises and uh, after hearing yesterday already the presentations and also now i thought um, maybe she would say 
you should honor me by criticizing me much more than you are doing. Uh, uh, and I, I do not know, there's a nice poem by Bertolt Brecht about Lenin that said, um, they honored Lenin by doing something useful for themselves and they are doing something useful for themselves by honoring Lenin. I think we should refer to Luxembourg in the same way. Uh, and one way to honor her is really to look into the contradictions and the problems of her work. Uh, and I will do it. Maybe uh, I think it's a division of labor. Um, um, others already have praised her. I will criticize her uh, uh, because uh, the um, title of this um, workshop here is Rosa Luxemburg on the challenge of political strategy. And I think that if you are looking on the work of Rosa Luxemburg, you already mentioned this book. So I must show you because there's a lot of praise in this book, but I will concentrate on the critique now. Um, the tremendous strengths of Rosa Luxemburg, of course, lay above all in the brilliant analyzers she has made, making, in the pointing out new developments very in detail in the sharp formulation of contradictions like um, Leah and Joshua also already mentioned. And also I think in the prophetic insistence on the living heart of socialism. For her, this um, the spirit of socialism was a contradiction. Ruthless revolutionary energy on the one side and most all encompassing humanity. This is a contradiction and we should not blind ourselves that it's too easy to combine these the very different uh, approaches to social, socialism. Um, I think the, there's a other coin, uh, other side of the coin of the strengths of Rosa Luxemburg. There's also a weakness of Rosa Luxemburg because I think she was not very strong in dealing with the contradictions uh, we are facing um, with regard to uh, socialist strategies. There's a good metaphor by Walter Benjamin who was, was very schooled in defeat, uh, killing himself um, um, in 1940. Um, he said, if the left wants to sail against the storm, the capitalist and peerless storm, then it must be learned to set the sails in such a way that we are able to cruise against the wind, against the storm. That's a special art. Uh, and that means to, to be able to do so, it means that you are transforming the power of the wind, the storm against you into your own power. That means you are using the contradictions of the enemy. The, you are using the contradictions of the situation. You are using the contradictions where you are yourself in um, uh, for uh, going forward and strengthening yourself. Um, this is an idea. And I think Rosa Luxemburg and when I'm looking on all the speeches uh, um, yesterday, um, uh, of course, Rosa Luxemburg is the flag on our ship. It's uh, the compass we should use to know the direction, where to go, where to go. And especially the idea already mentioned to, to combine socialism and humanism, uh, socialism and democracy, socialism and ecology and socialism and feminism, all this uh, is the direction we should uh, aim to. But the problem for socialist strategies is to set the sails listfully, like Odysseus, to cruise against the storm. Uh, this is the problem. And I think this was not her strength. And I want to prove it. I can give different examples, but I want to concentrate on one which all Joshua especially already mentioned. This is her famous work on the Russian Revolution from 1918, written in prison, in the German prison and so on. Of course, we can quote different sentences from this famous uh, writing. 
and uh, uh, the, our enemies can do it and we can do it and um, whoever and everybody finds in this writing something he would like. The problem is it's a whole, it's an art, it's a, it's a, a product of art. Um, uh, and I'm looking on this um, like a symphony, like a classical symphony consisting of four movements, yeah? like the heroic of Beethoven or others. Yeah? And um, the Russian Revolution begins at the part one and two and the, the final part um, praising the Bolsheviks and saying they were able to set free, as you, Joshua, already said, setting free the energy and the self-determination of the masses, overthrowing Tsarism, overthrowing the, the capitalist class in, in Russia, the bourgeois class, and so on. And um, so I, we can take the, this beginning and the end as a first and the fourth movement of her symphony. And she's saying in this sense, that means the sense of setting free the energy of the people um, um, and uh, directing it, the future everywhere belongs to socialism, uh, to Bolshevism, sorry, to Bolshevism. Uh, but one can also read this final sentence of her writing um, like this, it's only in this sense that the future everywhere belongs to Bolshevism because she was not so much interested in the red flag on the Smolny or the uh, Winter Palais or the Kremlin. One must look now on the second and third movement where she is criticizing the Bolsheviks. Again, I want to mention, she is at the same time praising and criticizing the Bolsheviks. And then the common theme is always self-empowerment of the masses. Yeah, um, um, This is a, a, a motive for the whole um, symphony. In the second movement, we should not forget, she is strongly criticizing the Bolsheviks because the Bolsheviks took over the program of the Social Revolutionary Party and said, okay, we are giving the land to the, uh, to the peasants. Even Leni was saying, it's not our, we are, we are, it's not our idea, but it's demanded by the, by the peasants. We would, do, we would like to do something different. The bot is, Rosa Luxemburg is demanding, you should give it not directly to the peasants, more or less for private use, but you should organize cooperatives and state farms. Um, but, and she was also, um, Leah spoke about this, she was totally against giving uh, the suppressed people of uh, the suppressed nationalities um, at the periphery of the Russian Empire the right for, indi for, for indi uh, creating independent states. He was totally opposed and she said against both tendencies we should use the iron hand of dictatorship. Yeah? Against, rem uh, remember, against the peasants and against suppressed nations, you should keep them in one empire and you should direct them directly to socialism. I'm simplifying, but this was the idea nevertheless behind. And uh, then in the third, also, and she has known very well why the Bolshevists were doing this. Not because they were convinced this is a good idea, but they wanted to reduce the opposition against the Soviet government. Uh, that was the reason why they were doing, uh, Lenin was totally aware we need the support, at least the neutrality of the peasants, at least the neutrality of the Finns and the Lithuanians um, uh, and so on. Um, okay, then in the third movement, Rosa Luxemburg was strongly refuting all measures taken by the Bolsheviks to deal with the still existing contradictions. Why? dictatorship, by suppressing freedoms, by um, uh, implementing harsh red terror from above. A ruthless terror, don't forget it. Eh? And, and it was not that was the answer towards the white terror, but the Bolsheviks from the very moment started it themselves. Uh, um, if you're looking on the works of, uh, of Lenin, it's totally clear, he was, uh, he was ready he was clear by, by the experiences of the French Revolution, if you want to defeat the enemy, you need terror. That was his strong, uh, strong position. Okay, so but so on the one hand, she was saying, 
go directly to that socialism, but do it, even if there will be strong opposition, but do it in the most democratic way. That means we, we want to have socialist democracy and we want democratic socialism going in the same time hand in hand. But of course, you, you must understand how can this work using the iron hand and giving free speech and a freedom of assembly to everybody and so on. This is, at least if you're looking on the concrete situation in Russia, totally impossible. And I think it's in a lot of revolutionary situations, you can't just do this in this way she is recommending. Yeah? Um, the, but why could, could she do it? Why could she do it? She thought, if you are putting even by force the, the workers, the peasants, the nations into in the situation of common property in one common state, then out of this, you are quoting it, Joshua, then out of this, new instincts are emerging, directing to socialism, new desires will emerging, and uh, the freedom goes into the necessity of socialism. So necessity of freedom, there's for her no contradiction if we have implemented socialist uh, uh, conditions. I, again, I'm simplifying, but nevertheless, this was, I think, why she could um, put the, the contrapoints from the second and third movement into harmony. The problem, I think, why I'm speaking about this, I think it's important for the strategy today. I'm totally worried if there are any proposals from the left or ideas from the left, which are neglecting contradictions. The contradictions, uh, not from the contradictions of capitalism, but the contradictions of our own emancipatory movement. We are in divided empire by the real situation. We are uh, marked by contradictions and also that is important I think for me the socialism we are striving for will be also marked by contradictions I want to uh, and this was behind the problems of the left in the 20th century or maybe all and already I think in the in this uh, in the Marxist uh, Marxism of the 19th century because the Marx idea of, of, of communism was also a non-contradictory society where we do not need contradictory forms of mediation, like law, like markets, whatever, yeah? like the, the state will vanish and so on. But we should understand socialism is a complex society and there are contradictions and they will stay with us between the individual, collective and the overall social development. So these contradictions won't disappear. So if you are looking already today for elements and, and tendencies toward a socialist economy, we will create an economy marked by contradictions yeah, between strengthening the, let's say, communist foundations of society, ecology, social services, infrastructure, finances, and so on. And on the other hand, bringing it into relation with the self-responsible behavior of all forms of enterprises, collective, state, communal, private, whatever. Um, and uh, it will be a mixed economy. Also, we should be aware that democracy is also a contradiction. We won't be able to abolish the contradiction between what Rousseau was uh, uh, naming volonté générale, the will of all together, let's say, to, to keep our nature uh, bring, uh, intact, to, to bring it back to, to um, equilibrium on the one hand, and the, um, um, the volonté de tout, that means the, the will of the, all the, ourselves the indiv as individuals, as people living in, in a region, in a city, in a uh, smaller community, the, there will be deep contradictions. And if we are not looking on democracy also as a contradiction, and we are not able to ask ourselves how we can strengthen the volonté générale, the common will of all together. And uh, this is a stupid idea that this common will of all together will just 
spontaneously emerge out of the expression of the, the individual will of, of the many, even of the workers, it won't. We have these contradictions in the working class, of course. So the problem is to deal with these contradictions and I'm coming to the end. Uh, I, I think we should avoid what I would uh, call wishful thinking, uh, which is not looking on the contradictions. And um, so I think we must take with us Luxembourg as the, the prophetess, as the compa compass for democratic socialism. We must look on Lenin for strategic intervening action. We must look on Gramsci, the philosopher of dialectical practice, but also <coughs> we must look very concretely, Joshua, you mentioned it, uh, to the wisdom of the people who know that we have these contradictions. They are not stupid. And if we are not addressing them with the knowledge and with regard to these contradictions, then they won't believe us. They won't say, you are just telling some very nice things, but we can't believe we will cause, you are not serious about the contradictions. And that is, a, a, so a, I beg your pardon that I criticize today on her birthday, Rosa Luxemburg, but I think this is also part to honor her. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Michael. I guess we already raised most of the important uh, topics um, here in your three conversations, reform and revolution, the question of violence, and I guess um, your idea about that we have to focus on the contradictions and not try to avoid them while developing a left uh, political strategy was very important as well. My idea would be now, because we also have several um, questions in the chat, and um, one is about the, the relevance of self-determination uh, today and uh, um, uh, concerning the question of migration and refugees. Um, another uh, another question um, raises up um, the, 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 the concept of um, counter-violence and understanding counter-violence as one um, uh, of, of the things we need to, um, we have to have in mind with. And um, so, and I, I know because I know the three of you also interacting. So my idea would be that we start around, um, because we have uh, 30 minutes left, like around seven, eight minutes each, um, starting Leah, because you started, and I guess you have a lot of things to say to Joshua and Micha as well, and then Joshua and Mich Micha, and we gonna, and I'm going in, in between, and we see if we have more questions from the audience. Okay, Leah, do you wanna start? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, thank you. I also, I really enjoyed their presentations as well. Maybe I could start by uh, answering this question around self-determination and the kind of the role of nationalism and then weave that into uh, my then, you know, thoughts about the other presentations as well. I guess, um, I mean, we see, well, in Europe, we don't really have self-determination struggles of the kind that, you know, Rosa Luxemburg would have been familiar with. I mean, there's, of course, boundaries questions, and I come from the Balkans, and there's fraught issues there with regards to national self-determination, but on the whole, it's not on the agenda of any of the kind of main Western powers. But uh, what we do have is, as I think the, the person who put the question in the chat is, the legacy and the impact of those struggles for self-determination, even where those that go on outside Europe and the implications that they have for the movement of people and for the challenging of borders in Europe as well. And I think on that question, I would, I mean, I'm personally inclined to take a kind of halfway line, I guess, between, uh, between Luxembourg on, and Lenin on that matter. I don't think, I don't think this is also going a little bit more on the what you know Misha started by saying we need to be more critical and uh, so you can we can reward we can celebrate Luxembourg by being more critical of her the, there is a worry that she is I guess in criticizing so sharply this idea that you know the state is the unit should not be seen as the unit of progressive struggle there is a worry, a worry that she's romanticizing the struggle as such and that the struggle needs to have a target. And I suspect what was going on when, you know, Lenin and the other Marxists and those who were um, campaigning in favor of self-determination was, was to give that struggle a target which has to do with the institutions of the state, which has to do with 
changing laws and with changing uh, legal, constitutional of the situation. And I think she acknowledges obviously this, she acknowledges the centrality of these institutions and the centrality of law and of the coercive power of the state. But she's, um, in the end, she's reluctant to commit to this idea that in the end, the state is the kind of progressive emancipatory unit. And so I think that question is very much our question as well. I mean, if you think about, for example, the way in which the critique of the European Union takes place in a number of European countries. I'm in, Bro I'm in Britain. And so this was, you know, when Bre Brexit started, there was a, a whole section of the left which was in favor of Brexit and against the European Union because it saw the uh, repossessing of power nationally as potentially conducive to emancipatory struggles and so on. And it wasn't just a question of uh, strategy. I think it was also a question of, well, you need to, uh, revalue sovereignty and you need to kind of by reappropriating sovereignty you can um, then also weave into that reappropriation of social of, of sovereignty the quest for socialism and of course you know practically we know that this is not how it works we know that in the case of brexit for example that campaign was hijacked by um, by the right and so even the left was left empty-handed in the end but we can ask you know what would have happened if the, the left had been more hegemonic but I suspect that from a kind of Rosa Luxemburg perspective, she would have been skeptical of that as well. She would have said, look, what are you going to do? If you don't have, if you're not fighting European capital, you're fighting domestic capital. In the end, capital is the same and it's just the different coalitions of forces that change, but ultimately the, the target is the same. I do, however, think that where she become, where I think, uh, uh, you know, it's important to think about her contribution is in thinking about the enfranchisement of migrants. I think she would have campaigned for having votes for migrants and for having legal recognition, not as an end in itself, but as a further uh, step in the kind of emancipatory struggle. On the, um, I, I, I guess I wanna kind of maybe say something more about this question of you know the state and what, I think I kind of agree actually with Misha, uh, what he was saying at the end that in her debate with Lenin, I think it's important to see the both points of view in a way and not to, uh, as I say, not to kind of romanticize uh, Rosa Luxemburg completely, because I think the, um, the democratic centralist model also has a point when it comes to questions of organization. And that um, sometimes the conflict or the, the disagreement between the two can be overstated. I think Luxembourg would have acknowledged at the time that in Russia, where you didn't have a workers uh, movement that was that had any chance of political representation, where you know most people were illiterate, where there were huge questions of uh, epistemic injustice, actually, so epistemic disenfranchisement, where people just because they had been excluded from institutions for such a long time, they didn't have the tools to uh, work with these institutions. They weren't given the opportunities, and they didn't have the tool. And so, what a progressive uh, force had to do at that point was to also in some ways become the educator and I think this is where her her dialogue with Lenin should be seen about how that process of education works under conditions of severe not just political disenfranchisement but also epistemic disenfranchisement what does it mean for for people and I think as I say one can see the concerns on on both sides and I suspect that she was right in saying that when you have a kind of vanguard model that isolates the, the leaders from the masses too much, then that has uh, implications for even after when the revolution is successful, because it leads to this kind of entrenchment of a technocratic elite that then is used to just doing things their own way. But I think Lenin would have been right that if you don't have a kind of element of political organization in the form of a political party, for example, which is run with certain disciplinary constraints, with certain um, organizational principles and so on, the risk is that the movement just becomes dispersed and you never get a kind of focal point for the struggle. So I think, you know, the, the truth is somewhat in between. Okay, Joshua, do you want to go um, on and answering? We still have some topics in the, um, in the chat about the French Revolution. Micha mentioned that already as well. We discussed already a little bit on Lenin, um, but I guess um, there are more questions in and also the question about the counter violence um, from the um, from the working class. Uh, 
Oh, it seems, uh, yeah, we seem to have lost Joshua. So why don't we let uh, Misha go Yeah, first. so Misha, you go first. I just saw that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, also firstly, Leah, um, I, um, I would dis <laughs> also hey, dispute you with regard to the na uh, national question of Rosa Luxemburg. What I think the logic of her, if we are looking on the concrete works uh, on the Polish question, especially, she was saying, the Pol as I'm now concentrating just on Poland, yeah, to be, she said, the Polish people are living in three empires, the Russian Empire, the Kaiser Gem Empire, and the Habsburg Empire. And we should, it's totally contrary, I think, to what you are saying. Um, we should, uh, because the conditions are framed by three empires with three different economies and three different state systems. So we are fighting three struggles. Yeah? And then she said, so we must, in the, in the German case, we must go together, also the Polish must be go to the Social Democrats, must, must go with the uh, German Social Democratic Party. In Russia, we must uh, uh, cooperate. She, she did not cooperate totally, of course, herself, but she recommended it. Uh, with, the, with the Russian Social Democratic Party as even the most uh, revolutionary force in Russia and uh, the same in Habsburg. So she was not referring to globalization. She was contrary, referring to the markets of the empires and the state in the empire. That, and she said, okay, well, and, and there was a second argument. She said, if we would be able to create one whole state, we would have to defeat three empires. So why not first go to socialism? This was here. If you are so strong to defeat three empires, then we should go much better directly to, to, to socialism, what she has not foreseen. And this was a part of strategic weaknesses. Weaknesses. Um, Leni was said, we must be ready for all circumstances, even for the crash of the empires. She has not foreseen this possibility. She had no strategy for this case. Okay, this is, but I think it's important we should uh, discuss it furthermore. Uh, there are two questions I should answer. Uh, the first is uh, if uh, the problem with contra uh, the, the alliance of communists and non communists left and so on, and vanguardism, oh, sorry, as the first contradiction in, of Rosa Luxemburg, Brazil, and so on. I, I, I think. One, one we, man must understand Rosa Luxemburg was not a German. She was not a German. She was a Polish Jew. And even on the, uh, on the um, party congresses of the German Social Democratic Party, she stressed all the time, I'm a Polish. Yeah? Uh, uh, so she brought together, that's interesting. And it's almost neglected. Her Polish writings are not translated and uh, only partly translated and not still included in the German edition of her works and not in the English. So we, we are still neglecting the Polish heritage of her. Um, but one must understand she brought together the currents from Russia and Poland and the current of uh, Central Europe um, and, and the West. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, her dealing with contradictions and so on uh, has much to do with, with Germany. One problem, uh, sorry, again, I'm, st st I'm uh, stressing one weakness. Um, Dunayevskaya uh, rightly said that Rosa Luxemburg did not draw the strategic conclusions from her own theory of accumulation. Because there she said that we are exploiting the non-capitalist sector. But she was not looking on the non-capitalist sector as a, as a, the people there as actors of fights against imperialism and capitalism. This was only done later by the uh, Communist International. And concerning the problem of Angard, I agree with, um, with the position of, of Lea. We, of course, Rosa Luxemburg looked more on, on the self-organization from below, the self-learning of the masses. But also, we will find in her works a lot of references, what is leadership and so on. Um, uh, I think she still neglected the, the role of core leaderships 
of central, also of central leadership and the importance to, to create for, especially for concrete decisive moments, this and also maybe for the long, uh, long term uh, development. And um, so again, we must find forms to deal with the contradictions between self-organization from below and the role of avant-garde uh, on the other and not, need, not to go to one or the other direction. Both are indispensable for emancipatory struggle, I would say. Um, thank you. Leah, do you wanna add? I want to say something about uh, there was a question. Uh, well, okay, I want to say something back to Misha because I have I think we might have a slight disagreement on Poland national self determination. So I just want to bring it out maybe a bit more. And and I mean I don't know if that's relevant generally, but I, I suspect it also relevant. It has implications for how one thinks about contemporary questions as well. Because I think Misha, I think you 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 seem to imply in your argument that the reason she was against this self-determination issue was that it was a question of balance of strength. And so it was some a kind of strategic question. Like she said, if we are strong enough to fight three empires, then why don't we do, do socialism? But I think she was actually, it's, it wasn't just a question of calculation of strength, I suspect. Because if it had been just a question of calculation of strength, that would also be dependent on the political practice in a way. It wouldn't be a question that you decide in the abstract. But in the way in which she, with the SDKP, undermined the main Polish social democrats who were going for national self-determination, it's not clear to me that if you just look at the kind of empirical situation of where the strengths and the weaknesses of the movement were, her position was in a minority because in Poland there was also national bourgeoisie that was in favor of national self-determination. So it's not as if, you know, there was just the left movement and then the left movement had to decide. There was a kind of left movement that I think was working in parallel with the liberal movement, as it were, with the kind of enlightenment, enlightened Polish bourgeoisie that had wanted to have um, a self-determination of Poland. So I think, um, I suspect she was against it because I think she thought that, you know, this is capital for the same reason for which she was against the German social Democrats voting for the war credits and having these kind of displays of patriotism because she thought ultimately it doesn't really matter whether it's national capital or international capital, it's capital all the same. And so, you know, I can fight either of them and which of them I choose to fight becomes then a question of strategic priorities. But since I'm kind of uh, taking over, then I might as well take over with this systemic change ambition, I think. But I, I hope, yeah, as you say, I mean, we'll continue this discussion. There is an interesting question that came up, uh, Johanna, in the chat about, which I think is connected actually to this Polish self-determination and her position on Polish self-determination for how would we think about the alliances between the left? Because I think her position on Poland is, is sort of instructive to think about that because she clearly rejected these kind of national alliances with the bourgeoisie for the sake of self-determination when the left was in a position of minority. So I don't think she would have abstractly rejected any alliances between the left which has very different strategic aims and in some ways also a different vision. But I think she would have said, it's important to think about alliances depending on what your own strengths and weaknesses are. In other words, the, being in an alliance can't be a priority in itself. And being in an alliance can be important if, you you're, if you're in that alliance from a position of strength, but it can also be crashing and kind of uh, in some ways suppressing your aims if you were there from a position of weakness. And so just being part of an alliance as such doesn't really mean very much. It depends on from what position you enter that alliance. If you enter it from a position of strength and you have chances of shaping the movement and kind of exercising intellectual as much as political hegemony, then fine. But if you enter from a position of weakness and that means that the, 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 then the bigger coalition suppresses your distinctive identity, that can become a danger. And then in the end, you end up being completely marginalized. And I think historically, there's good examples to see how this has also played out with forces of the extreme left. So there's the danger of you know, sectarianism on the one hand, which says, you know, never make any alliances. But then on the other hand, there is the, the danger of kind of homogenizing too much and just losing your identity. And that's also you know, a problem because then you lose the vision and you kind of use, lose the uh, systemic transformation uh, ambitions. Um, Micha, I guess you want to react on that, and I guess um, what Leah just said is exactly the moment uh, where the German left is in, because we are facing 
an election, you know, this fall where, where we could end up, you know, to the question how to deal with a situation where we probably not enter from a position of strength, um, but we also might um, need to react because we otherwise would leave, um, would leave the field to the right, you know, and this could um, maybe, Micha, you could also um, say something on that. There's a nice saying of Heinrich Heine, Denk ich an Deutschland in der Nacht, when I'm thinking about Germany in the night, I can't sleep anymore. Um, okay, um, um, the problem I think everywhere for the left is now, is the problem. We have seen it in the United States, we have seen it later, I think in Great Britain and so on. The ability of the left to build up an own attractive center of gravity is very weak at the moment. This is our main problem. Yeah? We are totally faced by, by, on the one hand, we see the urgency of the situation. Yeah? We see the catastrophes going on, yeah? wars and ecological destruction, the pandemic and so on. And on the other hand, we see this terrible weakness. Um, and this is also true for the German left, of course, yeah? and for the German left left. Yeah? This is... Um, so uh, we are stuck in this uh, very difficult situation um, and uh, but but i don't really i Johanna, i don't want to uh, discuss now inner german too much inner german questions they are very complicated i think uh, i just want to um, uh, but i think this is a problem and but we also must see that uh, maybe one remark uh, with regard to germany nevertheless even the weak german left was able to put important things on the agenda. The minimum wage, the pension question, uh, the now we see pandemic, we need common ownership of the health service. Of course we need it. Yeah? When we uh, uh, so we even not being in government, we were able to, to, uh, to put some very important topics on the agenda, the, the, house, uh, the housing question also famous since Engels and so on. So let's see how we can deal with this contradiction. Um, um, I just want to uh, make two remarks. Uh, one is uh, about a question from India. There I agree totally with Lea, but uh, only I want to add one insight, strategic insight from Lenin. He said, those who want a purely, purely socialist revolution will never get any socialist revolution. Always you need alliances, and then you must fight to able to steer them. That's the problem. Yeah? Not alliances or not, but if you are able to, to um, put them into the, the right um, direction. And uh, Lea, my argument was not just about the, the strengths of power relations, but the role of the concrete market system, the concrete state system. But I agree with one point. The problem. And I think with this regard, Rosa Luxemburg was very insightful. She, because you might, we, we have forgotten it. All the Polish and the Jewish and so on were living in empires, not in nation states. They have known what it is and how dangerous the setting free of nationalism and racism is. Yeah, this unbelievable power of racism and nationalism. And she was very, with the experiences of pogroms yeah, in her own time, yeah, they have known what it means. Yeah? And um, uh, those who were concentrating on the national question were playing with, a, with, a, with the devil, with the devil. Uh, and she has known it from the, the, her heart. Uh, and this we should we should be very aware from the left. Never play with this devil. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, Joshua, um, it's good that you are back. Do you, do you might um, want to answer the question about the counter violence and also if you have comments to what Micha and Elia said before? Yes, uh, about counter violence. That's what uh, Rosa Luxemburg speaks when she speaks about the latent. Uh, violence and the active violence uh, in the, um, the article I, uh, I quoted. Uh, this means that, yes, uh, 
um, there is two phases in violence for her. One is latent. It means that um, the working class has firstly to um, unify itself, to show that it is uh, capable of violence before using it. And in order to gain this capacity of violence, of course, uh, there is a, a, a counter violence to, to show, uh, to resist against the, the powers of uh, the ruling class. And that's this latent phase uh, of violence that she spoke about. So that's the trade unions, that's the, the resistance of the, um, the demonstrations and uh, the strikes. Uh, and then once it is capable of uh, showing that it is unified, that it is capable of resisting, then starts the new phase of active violence where um, the, the working class has to show and to, to get um, into a clash with the ruling class. So counter-violence is just the first phase of the, the action of the, the proletariat. There comes another. And um, what did I want to say about this other phase? Yes, there is also a problem that I didn't uh, talk about, uh, which is about Gewalt, violence in, uh, in German. So Gewalt, that is the word of violence, can be understood as violence, but also as power just simply power, the capacity to uh, exert force. That is the legal power of the state, for example. So we, we never can be sure that uh, Rosa Luxemburg is speaking about either violence on a pure uh, form or the capacity to exert its own power, which has no, uh, uh, not necessarily a, um, a brutal uh, understanding to have. So um, the, the, the second phase, the, the exercising Gewalt, doesn't uh, necessarily mean using uh, violence in order to rule, but just expressing its power as uh, the new uh, ruling class of the proletariat. So I hope I'm clear about that. OK. Um Thanks a lot. Um, I I was um, like for the end of our discussion. I really would like to go back what you said, um, Micha, in the beginning, using um, Rosa Luxemburg as a compass. You know, for for many things we are and um, we are doing right now concerning you know feminism, um, ecology, and a lot of other things, but um, not neg neglecting the the contradictions. You know, we are facing when we are thinking about her. My question um, to the three of you for the last um, statements would be then, how could we communicate to the, to the coming generations, you know, that there are contradictions we need to focus without making the things too complicated? Because we see that the right is rising because it seems that they are, could give simple answers. Would, what would you recommend and would Rosa Luxemburg having an idea about um, how to deal with that situation? And is there anything else you want to share with us? Leah starts. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, I guess I'll start by saying that we should, you know, the world is complicated and I don't think we should simplify it. And I think the left should not be in the job of simplifying, actually. I think we should win the arguments, but with every step and you know have the patience to pursue these arguments and also have the kind of historical knowledge and, and insight to develop our arguments with our experience with the history in mind and and so keep both the kind of the past and, and the present and the future together but i don't think uh, and again i think maybe this is um you know i'm skeptical because i as i said i started with my skepticism about you know electoral strategies and messaging and so on and of course there is a lot of pressure in today's society to simplify, to make things, you know, accessible and easy and clear and so on. But I think ultimately that's a trap. And it's also a trap that is not in the service of the left because, the, you know, the history of the left is a very complicated history. It's a history that brings together philosophy, economics, politics, law, and in a way, enable in order to understand the constraints and the kind of the requirements of systemic change, one should really see the world with all of these things in mind. And there is just no shortcut. I don't think, you know, if you want shortcuts, you can be a social democrat, I guess, or you can be a, but if you're a, um, a radical, for, for a radical socialist who cares about the principle as much as they care about the practice, I think it's really important that we actually keep 
working on the principles and keep working on the theory and and try and make theory accessible but not reduce it and and try and kind of involve people and i think that's actually what democracy really is i mean democracy is and as rosa luxemburg said it's a kind of educational process is a process through which we participate and we create knowledge together but we do that with awareness of all the tensions and all the contradictions and as much uh, being alert to detail as possible so that's my you know what would i say to future generations i would say never forget the past and keep thinking about the past as a source of knowledge for how you want to create projects in the future and just live that kind of uh, live the past and, and know the past with both the contradictions in mind but also the hope that is always there and that people always kind of fight to to bring out and if one has that awareness which i think was rosa luxemburg's historical awareness then i think there is also hope for the future and then the 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 solutions don't come from you know the simplification or from the slogans or whatever but they come from just having developed this collective knowledge so yeah sorry that was a slightly grand uh, note ending but yeah <laughs> whatever no it was great joshua do what do you want to add something as well uh, and then Misha. What, what could i add to this uh, great answer just maybe read theory just uh, come from the world and gauge into practice um there is something with rosa luxembourg that is great is that there is a clarity in our texts there is no much difficulty to engage into theory when you uh, start reading rosa luxembourg so the the first step would be just take a book that she, that she wrote take articles from rosa luxembourg and read them and confront them with your critical thoughts uh, question what uh, are they still um, currently uh, accurate to the the present days and you will see that they are they have lost nothing of their accuracy and efficiency to understand uh, uh, the um, the modern problems of our, of our world and then of course with theory you have to engage into practice and uh, face uh, the, the the problems of your your current days so that's it Okay, Micha. Yes, firstly, I want briefly uh, answer one question here in the chat. The problem of uh, if uh, non-capitalist areas could make a revolution against capital uh, and uh, totally right that um, um, only in the maybe in the in the beginning of the 20th century uh, capitalism arrived somehow, but never, nevertheless, for, not, don't forget Capitalism came to India, capitalism came to Latin America earlier. Yeah? There were the Mexican Revolution. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think, a concrete question. Of course, at the time when Rosa Luxemburg was writing her work on the accumulation of capital, already uh, these contradictions were in the colonies and, the, and in the periphery and the semi periphery there. Yeah? Um, uh, but uh, okay, but this is just I want to mention it, it was she could have drawn these con consequences um, uh, earlier and or at the same time as Lenin and others, Bukharin. Okay, but uh, answering your question, Leah, today I want to, to argue all the time with you because, of course, you're totally right. For intellectuals, your answer was. I totally agree, but our task also is to what, uh, what is important from all these complicated questions. We should look what Lenin, again, I'm quoting Lenin because he was a real brilliant strategic thinker. What is the main, the, the, the decisive link in the chain? Yeah, what, where can we go through? So this is, this is a dialectical form of simplifying. Uh, this, I think, it's not simplifying as, as such, but to see where is where we can bring these very different forces together and make a difference, a real difference as the left. So our task is not only to analyze the complicated world, but also to see where the contradictions are uh, getting a form which is able to really use these contradictions to break through uh, the, the wall. Um, and then, uh, of course, you need concrete slogans, very precise and somehow simple. Yeah? If we have, we have it here in Berlin, simple, stop the increase of the rent of the flats. 
Yeah, it's a very easy answer a lot, but people of don't are not stupid. They know that there are a lot of contradictions with this and we should not blind ourselves. We should speak about this content, but nevertheless, for the moment, it's clear it's organizing and some other like this. So I think um, that the, the art of dialectics is out of complicated analysis. We should find these decisive forms uh, to break through and uh, of course knowing that when we are getting through there will be a lot of new contradictions um, this is important not to think not to think now it's very simple no it will be again very complicated thank you Okay, I have um, the task now to thank um, the three of you. I guess um, we all did our best and I enjoyed it much. I really have to say personally, this was one of my, my highlights of the day of Rosa Luxemburg's 150th birthday that we had the chance to go so deep into the discussion about her thinking. And now um, after I raised the question in the beginning, what would she would have thought? I guess she would have listened our debate um, very very interested and would be happy that we managed to celebrate her by criticizing shouted, her and discussing with her. Huh? <laughs> she would have shouted, criticized us. Yeah, that, she, that, she would have criticized uh, us back. She was very <laughs> I also recognize that we do have an annual conference now, we, um, how, um, we, how we learned, you know, to do it online. And the next one will be definitely focusing the question of what would have Rosa Luxemburg thought about populism and how could we react on it? Because this is a topic, you know, we are um, we, um, we are walking through. So um, thanks a lot, Leah, Joshua and Micha. We're we gonna uh, be in a probably life and work long discussion with each other, which makes me very happy. And um, and we, are, we all are looking forward to celebrate Rosa Luxemburg now in the upcoming weeks and in the upcoming years. Um, um, we're going to start again here at uh, two o'clock with a panel, which you definitely should not miss. It's Rosa Luxemburg and the written word shared by my colleague Julia Killett. And I guess they are three of the most important um, female writers about Rosa Luxemburg on the panel. Helen Scott, Kate Evans, who wrote the wonderful Red Rosa novel, and Dana Mills, who, who is doing like a lot of things around Rosa Luxemburg, not only writing, she is also... Um, interview partner of Paul Mason in the films um, we produced also on the occasion of Rosa Luxemburg's um, birthday right now. In the break now, in between, um, you don't have to, to leave um, the, the, the stream here because we're going to present a um, video which was produced in our office in Hanoi. I already um, told you that like all over the world, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is celebrating and everybody who just wants to get an ins inspiration what is happening um, very far in the East should stay here. So thanks a lot to all of you and um, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.